Okay, so um, traditional telephone star six. Um, beyond that, I think we're good to go. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're in Galatians chapter three today. Um, really, the first 14 verses will be our main set of text. Um, as we begin, let's just have a moment of prayer, shall we? Father, we come before you and we are indeed thankful. Thankful that you would welcome us into your presence. Thankful that you would um, share with us your word, uh, the, the message that ultimately led to Jesus Christ, so that we would know what he came for, what purpose he brought, and the example that he would live um, so that we could have redemption, so that we could have a home with you eternally. Father, we know that these were not things built up on our own merits, upon our own strengths and, we and strengths, uh, but really was based upon our weakness, our humanity, and our need. But ultimately, these were things done through your love. Thank you for your love for us. We would, we would never have made it in any capacity had it not been for you. I ask that you be with us this morning as we look at Galatians, as we spend time in this book. Father, thank you for preserving it. Thank you for giving it to us. And in this time of life, I pray that we can find an application for us uh, from what Paul wrote to the churches in the region of Galatia. This we ask through your blessed Son, the Holy One Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're beginning in Galatians chapter 3. What I want us to do is uh, I want us to spend a little bit of time going through. Uh, we're only going to discuss a few of the questions. I want us to cover the whole set of texts fairly quickly, and then at the very end, try and find some sort of an application or, or something that would fit for us. Um, but let's read verses, three, uh, verses 1 through 6 um, ever so briefly. And um, if someone online has Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, if they would feel free to unmute and read that for us. What is it, Josh? I got it. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. All right, hang on. I'm reading from the New Century Version. Okay, thank you. You people in Galatia were told very clearly about the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But you were foolish. You let someone trick you. Tell me this one thing. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Spirit by following the law? No. You received the Spirit because you heard the good news and believed it. You began your life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you are trying to make it complete by your own power. Oh, now are you trying to make it complete by your own power? That is foolish. Were all your experiences wasted? I hope not. Does God give you the spirit to work miracles among you because you followed the law? No. He does these things because you have heard the good news and believed it. The scripture says that the thing about Abraham, Abraham believed God and God accepted Abraham's faith and that faith made him right with God. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, as we begin these first, uh, this first little section, and I'm breaking it apart a little differently. I think verse six may, in your Bibles, may go with verse seven better, but I'm going to, I'm kind of mixing up the text a little bit. Um, we come to verse 2, and Paul asks a question to the church in Galatia. Um, what question is it that he asks, and what issue is he trying to address? It's not a trick question, is it? Did you, uh, you said trick works of the law? or through the gift of the Spirit, through faith. Um, and so as we look at the, this section of text, that's the question that we're really going to be addressing. Matter of fact, when I, when I went through this, I noticed that at the end of verse, or verse 2 
and verse 5 really are asking the same question. It's just used in a different language. Uh, and even in verse 3, he asked the same question. So there's this series of uh, rhetorical questions asked by Paul uh, to get the point across. He starts off, uh, before we really get into the questions though, he starts off, he says, oh foolish Galatians. Um, his point is, you've allowed someone to trick you. You're not really thinking with the entirety of your brain. You're not using some common sense and some logic. Who has bewitched you? Uh, it, it's not a, a spell that Paul is talking about being thrown up on the Galatians um, Paul's greater intent is you are not thinking clearly. You are not using the godly part of your mind in this thought process. And so as he's going with this, who's bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly crucified, uh, portrayed as crucified. Did the Galatians see Jesus crucified? The answer is no. There might have been a few who were there at the crucifixion of Jesus, but I'm going to guess that a large majority of the population did not actually see Jesus crucified. Uh, what Paul is doing is he's saying that the gospel message of Jesus' crucifixion has reached you. You were convicted by it, and you lived as a response to it. So you have seen all that the gospel entails through the crucifixion, and that's how you saw Jesus crucified. So let me ask you, did you receive the spirit of works of the law or by hearing with faith? Have you begun by the spirit or are you being perfected by the flesh? What was the principal problem in the region of Galatia that Paul's addressing? Who was coming into the region and, and sowing seeds of doubt and false teaching? The Judaizers. The Judaizers. And so they were coming into the region, and their principal message is, okay, well, great, now that you're following Jesus Christ, but Jesus was a practicing Jew, so therefore you should follow in the same footsteps. You need to be circumcised in order to actually follow Jesus. And when you have that message come up, you have some Gentiles who are following suit with that. And so Paul's questions come to that point. Did you receive the Spirit because you were circumcised? Or did you receive the Spirit because of faith? Now, the, the thing that, um, you know, what, I, what I'm kind of imagining Paul saying here is you have the Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit the moment the knife came on you and you went through surgery? Or did you receive the Spirit beforehand? And that's the question that Paul's really asking. Uh, so you come to verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you work miracles among you uh, do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And verse 6 is where the kicker comes in. Because verse 6 is where Paul begins to change our focus towards Jesus. Except he, he introduces us to a gentleman named Abraham. Abraham is the great example uh, to be used in this conversation. And we're going we're gonna to spend time in Galatians today. We're going to spend time in Romans as well because Paul builds the similar or the same arguments in the book uh, to the Roman church. But it says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. If you uh, are, take notes in your Bible, and your Bible may already possess some of the footnotes, um, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 is where we see this quote referencing back to Genesis 15, verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Notice this is when God makes a covenant agreement with Abraham. He's going to give him a generation of people or a, a, a children of people, if you will, that is a nation greater than the, the stars could be counted, greater than the sands of the seashore. So Abraham's going to receive an incredible blessing from the Lord. In receiving that blessing, Abraham had faith that God would provide it. And so in that process of faith, we come to Genesis 15 and verse 6, 
he believed the Lord, that the Lord would actually fulfill what he had promised, and God counted that to him as righteousness. Now, I, I may jump ahead a little bit, and so if I do, just forgive me. In Genesis 15, verse 6, is this before Abraham was circumcised or after Abraham was circumcised? This was before Abraham was circumcised. Thank you, whoever said that online, too. Uh, it, this was before Abraham was circumcised. So Paul, and, and so, I, so I don't forget this, the Jews love Abraham. Abraham is their man. He is the father of the faith. He's the father of the Jewish faith. And so for a Jew, and, and a lot of rabbis would make this case, they would say that Abraham was the true father of faith because he so followed the law that God loved him. He was so perfectly obedient that that's what instilled God's love to him. What Paul is doing is he's taking a great Jewish argument and ripping it to shreds. Abraham was given a promise by God, was blessed by God, was entered into a covenant relationship with God well before he obeyed. God told him, Abraham believed, and then it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul builds this argument in a continuation in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, uh, we're going to start in verse 3. Romans 4 and verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Yet again, a quote from Genesis 15. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. If you go to work tomorrow morning, tomorrow's Monday, you go to work, and you work um, your eight hours, you work the whole week for eight hours, it is technically due to you 40-hour work week, or whatever your pay would be for that time. So in a law-based system, what Paul's saying, your work is equated to righteousness. Abraham hadn't done any work, though. At this point, he hadn't accomplished anything. Let's skip down now to verse 9. This is Romans 4, verse 9. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Great question. And that's the question that we're asking in Galatians as well. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he was circumcised? There's our question. It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the circumcision as a seal of the righteousness. Well, we're going to use some of this language again here in a little bit. Let's skip down to verse 21, though. This is Romans 4.21. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, because he was fully convinced that God was able to do. It didn't matter that he was 100 years old. It didn't matter that Sarah was 90 years old. And before we get too far along in, uh, in, in, into questions, it's, I think, Genesis chapter 16, if my memory is correct, where Abraham um, sleeps with his Hagar, is that right? Sleeps with Hagar, and they have Ishmael. Um, so we're one chapter away from God's covenant promise, but yet the writers of Genesis, the writer of Genesis, and the writers of throughout the entire Bible are still portraying Abraham as a righteous individual. What I find interesting is, is almost Abraham seems to follow this second account of Adam. He's like another Adam in a sense. Because when, a, when Abraham falls in Genesis chapter 16, who was it that was there encouraging him to fall? His wife, Sarai. To accomplish God's will, she says, why don't you sleep with my maidservant, my handmaiden? So we see in the similar case, it's kind of like an Adam and Eve narrative. Adam is there. Adam is present. Adam should have manned up and said this was God's response. This is what we're going to do. But he didn't. Eve said, here's the fruit. It looks good. It tastes good. Let's eat it together. So we kind of have a, a narrative that's very similar to the Adam and Eve narrative. Um, but I want to ask a question before we move into verse 7. How does a person receive the Spirit? I 
Either then. 238. Acts 238. Acts 238. Can you quote it for me? You have to accept Jesus. I think, was that Bruce? Yeah, repent and be baptized for mission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the indwelling. Ah, thank you. I, I think that was Bruce. It sounded like you, Bruce. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. So we come to that same thought process, and that was, is, that's where Paul's at. Is he saying, how did you receive the Spirit? The Spirit was a gift from God given to you, not because you did right, but because God did right. And so as we think about Acts 2.38, is it necessarily still a gift because you've done right? No, even in baptism, I was still messed up. But because of God's righteousness, I am then gifted the Holy Spirit through Jesus' work on the cross. So as we continue that thought process, moving into verse 7, are there any questions before we move into verse 7? Okay, not seeing none. Verse 7. Uh, know then that uh, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. I highlighted this, or I underlined it, whatever you want to do. Um, I did that to verse 7, because I think that's Paul's next point. That the sons of Abraham can be anybody. Jesus used the phrase, son of Abraham, to Nicodemus. Was it Zacchaeus? Now I got my guys mixed up. Zacchaeus, I think. He was the wee little man. I think God and, and Jesus called him that there is no greater than us. I, I forget the phrase now. It skips me. It'll come back to me. But we know that Jesus used the phrase son of Abraham to talk about individuals, regardless of their uh, religious affiliation, that they were faithful and that God would hold them as faithful. So we know that verse 7 says, Know then that those of faith, not just Jews, those of faith, are sons of Abraham. Thank the Lord for that, because that allows us to be sons of Abraham or daughters of Abraham. And the Scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. As we go into verse 8, um, the thing that is most striking to me is really the start of verse 8. And the Scripture, anytime that the New Testament authors say Scripture, what are they typically talking about? Old Testament texts. Anytime we talk about Scriptures in the New Testament, it's going to refer back to an Old Testament text. So as we look at this section and the Scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Notice, if we were to go to the Old Testament and we were to read it and we were to live like a Jew, practice life like a Jew, we would look at people and would say, they cannot become sons of Abraham unless they do certain things. That is a complete separation. But Paul is building this argument that even in the time of the Old Testament period, there was foreknowledge that God was going to save the Gentiles. It was not strictly a Jew-only salvation, but that God was working to save all people. Preach the gospel. We sometimes question whether the gospel was preached in the Old Testament, but here Paul says the gospel was preached. It was proclaimed, and it was well known about before in Abraham. Romans chapter 3, if, you're, if you still got a finger in Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Talking about um, boasting in law, obedience, or in faith. Romans 3, 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentile also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. 
which is what we just said. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So we know that even in the times of old, even in the times when there was a law, uh, a law of obedience, God was still preaching the message of faith. And you go to um, Genesis, chapter thir- uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 13, at the very end of, ver- of verse 8, uh, there's this phrase, and you shall all nations be blessed. This was the promise to Abraham at the call of Abraham. That's Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. So what does the example of Abraham teach us about faith and righteousness? What does the example of Abraham teach us about faith and righteousness? We should put our faith in God and not the law. Ooh, faith in God and not in the law. And that's a, that's a real problem that they're experiencing is their faith in their obedience as compared to their faith in their God. Thank you. Who else? So, Josh, I think it tells us we're justified by the act of faith. But then when you look at Abraham's life, he still followed through. It's not that he didn't go or attempt to go through with the act. He Um, sometimes I think we separate the spiritual and the physical and here in these earthly bodies, everything spiritual has a physical element to it. Mm -hmm. And so Abraham acted in faith. He believed in faith. It was credited to him as righteousness, but that doesn't mean that he could just believe and not do anything. He actually tried to go through and live out his faith. Thank you, David. And, And isn't that the, um, I'm going to say the argument or the position, if you will, from the book of James. Show me your faith by your, or by, uh, without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And so we come to uh, this conversation of is spiritual living a matter of living or is spiritual living a matter of receiving? And we have two different perspectives from two different writers to two different sets of audience. But the difference is, is in Paul's account to Galatia, you've got a group of people who are saying, no, it is all about obedience. It is all about the dedication. And then the other side is saying, well, maybe I'm going to sit back. I'm going to take this easy because why does it matter? God's already saved. God's already done. So we can see that on the polar opposite ends of the spectrum, you're not right. You go too far to one way or the other way, you're going to be in the wrong. What it's about is finding the middle, finding the place where God is doing the work, but you and God have partnered together in a relationship. Thank you very much, David. Any other comments before we move uh, on to verse 9? Oh, Josh? Yes, sir. I think of it that Abraham didn't do it because he was commanded, but he understood and believed God, and he did it because he was drawn to do works. We should be drawn to do works because of the understanding of what God has done and given us salvation through his son. I I like the way you said that, drawn to good works. Right. You know, when we uh, we think of it, and a a question, I I hate to jump too far ahead, but, uh, you know, is, is the topic of baptism a work? Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and let you in on the very end point of my lesson here because I actually asked. I said, "Is baptism a modern equivalent of circumcision?" And I, the, the verse I think on is First Peter chapter three, verse twenty-one. Baptism now saves you. It's not getting wet. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but it's a pledge of a good good conscience towards God. Uh, there is an inner component to baptism that's far greater than the getting wet process. And so as we look at some of this, uh, some of this context here, spiritual living, and David, uh, David said this in his previous, to every physical thing, there is an equal spiritual component that we have to think about as well. 
back. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you. Okay. Moving on into verse nine then. Oh yeah, yeah. You want me back up there? Uh, let's see. Here we go. Roger wanted me back up on the big screen. Is it delayed up there? A little bit? Okay. Okay. Moving on into verse 9. A matter of fact, would someone be so kind if, uh, if you've got verses 9 through 14? Would somebody help to read that for us? Gosh, I can read again if I take care of everybody. T Tony, I appreciate you volunteering, but let's see if maybe we can get someone else who might jump up at the opportunity. Thank you, though. Someone here want to read our text? Roger, which you... verses, Josh? Oh, never mind. Go ahead, David. Never mind. Go ahead, David. Which verses? Uh, verses 9 through 14. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I highlighted verse 9 mainly because to me, verse 9 was actually leading us. Verse 9 and verse 14, I underline verse 14. Um, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I think the challenge then becomes for us to live as people who are of faith. Um, therefore, we can be called sons and daughters in the same line of the same way that Abraham was. Verse 10, he says that there's this curse to people who are under the law. And what he's reference, uh, referencing to is he actually quotes it. This is Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in this book. When you come to the ending of the book of Deuteronomy, the last few chapters before Moses passes, he, he gives a series of blessings and curses. And the thought process between, between every covenant relationship is if you uphold your end of the agreement, I will bless you. And if you mess things up, then I'm going to curse you. And that's the way the book of Deuteronomy ends. So the great book for the, of the law ends with this, if you obey the law, if you follow my commands, then I'm going to bless you. You're going to be my people. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to take care of your children. I'm going to do everything you could ever imagine for you. But if you do not, if you turn away from me, then I will curse you. I will, I will allow pestilence to come in. I will send foreign nations in. I will conquer you. We see that happen in the Testament, in the Old Testament. Um, I'm thinking Babylon, Persia. Um, I'm thinking those nations, we have seen it time and time again through human history. When people, and, and I'm going to say not to get anything political or present day, but I would say the same is true even in our world today. When nations are built upon godly principles, those nations seem to do well. And the further we get from godly principles, the more we have to be worried about. I would say that not just outside of our, not just to our nation, but even to our homes, to my family, direct family, to your direct families. If our homes are built on godly principles, those things last. Uh, this phrase of, of cursed be everyone who does not abide, I want to look at Jeremiah 11 verse 3. 
uh, just ever so briefly, Jeremiah 11, verse 3. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God. Jump over with me now to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. This is where I think we begin to see the movement of God calling all people. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. This is, in a sense, a calling from the Old Testament about people who would sin should die. But I appreciate the line, all souls are mine. We're being introduced to the reality that God has called Jew and Gentile into his presence. The ending, uh, moving into verse 11, uh, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Matter of fact, we even discussed that back in chapter 2, verse 6 of this same, of this same book of Galatians, that you are not justified uh, by your obedience, but rather by God. For the righteous shall live by faith. That comes from Habakkuk, or uh, I think if Greg is online, he would say Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk 2, which I always grew up saying at Habakkuk, like a hick from the sticks. So however you say it, you can say it with me. But um, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. There's another way of translating this, uh, which I, I appreciate. Uh, the one who by faith is righteous will live. When we look at that text, and, and I can't help but say when I was looking at Habakkuk 2 verse 4, something hit me was, it, is, this, is this the faith that I have in Jesus Christ living within me? that's keeping me faithful? Because the way Habakkuk reads is, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Just some interesting, who, whose faith is really there? And I'll let you ponder on that on your own free time. Verse 12, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by faith. Building this argument from the Old Testament, Leviticus 18 and verse 5. And then he makes this same case over in Romans chapter 5. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 10, verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. That person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that's to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that's to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. He's getting us even closer to what I'm going to say is the very last verse here. God calling of all, God's calling of all people. The word is in you. It's in your heart. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us by becoming the curse. Uh, and he says that cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. Deuteronomy 21, verse 32. It's interesting that in Deuteronomy, when the man was to be, or when the, the individual was crucified, was hung on a tree, in Deuteronomy's account, they were not to remain overnight. Now, for jumping forward several thousand years, the night that Jesus was crucified, how long was he up on the cross? Was it about six hours, but was he left there overnight? Even under Roman crucifixion, Jesus was not left there overnight. Um, in the law in Deuteronomy, when that command was given to uh, that someone hung on a tree was cursed by God. It was really, you know, you, you hung someone up to give warning, to give sign to other people, this is what happens. But uh, we also know that it was about not humiliating the family so much that they would 
not be able to live in society. I mean, it was, you have a punishment, but punishment has to end. We look to what Paul is doing as he's building this from Deuteronomy and saying, cursed is anyone who hung on a tree. He puts that and marries that to Jesus. And he says, Jesus was one who was hung on a tree, was cursed by God, but why was he cursed? He was cursed because he bore our sins. Because was it not I who should have been on the tree? Was it not me that belonged there? Yes, because of our sin. Yes, yeah. And so, so all of us were the ones that belonged there, but Jesus took that upon himself. He carried the curse with him. And when I mentioned earlier that, that I see this other account, in Abraham I see the account of Adam and Eve. You, know, you kind of see some of the same follies that happen. Notice in Adam and Eve's account, there's a tree that brings about the fall. But in our account, what brings about our, our salvation? Is it not yet again a tree? A tree that then appears in Revelation as the tree that gives eternal life. The one tree that remains in the heavenly realm. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14. So that in, Jesus, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Verse 14 is the powerhouse verse, in my opinion, of this little section, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Um, if you don't have a, a reference to Joel chapter 2, verse 28 here, I want you to write that down. Joel 2, 28. That's the, one of the key Old Testament texts of the Spirit being poured out upon all men, all women, all people. Um, there's some other ones you could write down, Isaiah 32, 15. It's interesting that when we look at this promised Spirit, we know that in, like I said, Isaiah 32, Joel 2, 28 is the key one. Uh, but we come to John chapter 7, and verse 39, we are told that the Spirit has not come yet because Jesus has not been glorified. And then we come to Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit is poured forth onto, all, onto people in ways that is beautiful and magnificent. And then I want, us to, I want us to finalize our discussion today in Ephesians chapter 1, ver, verse 13. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him... Or what? Were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Does anyone remember when I read earlier uh, in Genesis 15 about Abraham, uh, maybe it was a little later, 15, 16, 17, wherever, about Abraham's circumcision? Actually, it was Romans. Paul built the argument in Romans that Abraham's circumcision was his sealing to God. And what are we now told here at verse 14, or really in Ephesians 1, is that the Holy Spirit is what seals us to God. That's verse 13, sorry. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So as we conclude Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus Christ is our blessing because we are Gentiles, through the Spirit that was given to us by God. The problem of the storyline that I'm going to give you just to summarize this chapter is that Jesus answers our problems. Because we could not follow the law in a way that gave pure and true obedience, righteousness could not have been acquired on our own behalf. Righteousness was then the gift given by God through faith. Christ became our curse, caring for us the weight and the sin that so easily entangled, so that, as verse 14 starts, we may be blessed. And as I asked earlier, I find it interesting, would baptism then be our modern equivalent to circumcision? Would that be the thing that we um, have maybe carry forward, carried forward 
in the same thought process. That's what I've heard. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up because we need to go ahead and get transitioned over here. Um, but if there are there any closing comments or questions before we wrap up? Oh, yeah. Um, you got an email yesterday and a text was scheduled to go out. Oh, did it? Okay, I haven't gotten it yet. But uh, uh, with the link for the worship service today, we will be on YouTube today. Um, there is a link on Facebook, so you can find us on Facebook, but it's going to carry you over to YouTube. Um, but join us on YouTube today, and we will look forward to seeing you here in about 15 minutes. Have a great morning.